Hello, everybody. Thank you very much. I think we can all agree that we've heard some extraordinarily stimulating, too, yeah. <laughs> extraordinarily stimulating uh, discussions already. And I think one of the things that I'm conscious of is that they all interrelate and interweave in very interesting ways. And I hope we can draw some of that out in this conversation. I'd like to begin. Uh, by carrying on from Martin's cliffhanger from the, from the first discussion, and that's to talk about audiences. And I wonder if we might begin by Christopher and talk about... You've made these extraordinary leaps in terms of your collecting at Baltimore. How have you been able to take similar leaps in terms of the way that the audience has responded? Um, OK, so... I will begin with a disclaimer, which is um, I give presentations comparable to this one a lot. And I always talk about the necessity of change in five different categories, so exhibitions, acquisitions, public programs, staff, and board. And I would also add to that, and I think it's important, vendors, the vendors that you choose to work with. Mm -hmm. So beyond your internal structure, but if you're rebranding or you're considering building a building, those are areas in which you can advocate for equity in the way that most museums don't. So just adding that. Um, but when I give the presentation, um, there's keen interest and in people are sort of gratified by the progress. But the question is always, and so what has this done to your audience? Have you, have you been able to measure a change? So my response is that we have only very recently hired a team of people that are going to sort of codify and measure that change. So by the time we reach the fall of this year, which is in lots of ways a culminating moment for us, um, we should be able to answer the question of has your audience actually changed? Visibly, categorically it has. Not only has it grown, it's completely changed its constitution as well. But with that, I think I'm keenly aware that you, you earn trust and then you have to sustain it. So this the reverts back to my comment at the beginning about the necessity of sustainable change and resisting the impulse to say the job is done because it isn't. So. In, in terms of community engagement, how much have you been, uh, been able to do in terms of changing the way? Because obviously that seems to me to be key. If you're mm -hmm. going to, if you have these works, you have mm -hmm. to find ways to explain them in broader context. Right. And have you, I mean, you talked about the curatorial staff disappearing quite quickly. Yes. Yeah. Have, it, have you uh, have you had to make similar changes on, on an educational level or could community outreach level? Uh, no, because I think those impulses really naturally live within education and engagement departments, much more so than the cloistered ranks of curators. I mean, I think that the question for me is always more, how do you put engagement at the front end of gestation as opposed to adding it at the tail end once the show is completed? So how do you join reception, engagement, and curatorial practice at the front end so that the show is intrinsically open from the beginning? So no, I didn't think it involved radical restaffing on the educational. It involved empowering them to do more of the good work they were already doing. That's very interesting. Hilke. Um, it seems to me that you've gone to great lengths to reach out to your audience. I wonder, do you have any regrets about that, <laughs> given the nature? Given the na but I think this is a serious question, because to what extent do institutions lead and the audience follow? And to what extent does, does the institution need to reach out and pull in, as it were? And, and I wonder how you feel now about what you've done. Yeah, um, at the beginning, of course, it was really hard for me and it was really bitter. Um, but then I spoke to a lot of um, the writers of hate letters and the experiences I, 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 I made were always positive. So this was a great motivation. And then later I, and I still think that it's a great opportunity to get in contact with your public, that it's really motivating to see that we as museums are not mausoleums, but we are really places where discussions can take place, where different generations and um, yeah, people with different opinions and political ideas um, find together. And there are not so many places left where this happens. So I think it's a great chance. And um, even though it was hard, I'm really proud that my public is so interested in the contents of the museum that we have this opportunity. Mm. So I don't regret anything. It's good to hear. <laughs> uh, EJ, your project, it seems to me, the audience is right at the heart of it. 
and therefore, in a way, in a way, it seemed it seemed almost like the audience was leading the institution rather than the other way round. Can you tell me about? I mean, obviously, we saw lots of audience engagement in your in, in your presentation there. I'd like. I wonder how you feel about to what extent has the audience actually led other people in it, within the context that you've shown this museum. Um. It's been incredibly well received. Our footfall has changed. We've seen a different audience come through. Uh, we have, and the last count, there's an opportunity for people to leave a memo of what they think about the exhibition, their own tag, their own gender reflection. It's not an exhibition that's trans, it's an exhibition about gender. Um, so it speaks more broadly. And of the last count, we had 1,697 of those tags mm. left. There were 17 that were negative. So it's a, it's a very radical exhibition. It's got human body remains on it, and yet it doesn't have a negative impact at all you'd expect it to be to be much well to, to create a lot more animosity for how radical it is um, I think really ultimately the potential of the show though is for it to continue to to break ground in collecting at other institutions so when it tours it comes with an engagement policy not all trans experiences are the same they're certainly not as 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 vibrant necessarily in Brighton as they are in other parts of the country and so by going on tour and asking uh, and, and delivering the exhibition also with an engagement program it means that we can talk to those trans people while they're inspired by the exhibition, but work on this, this curatorial process of collecting their objects and having a living exhibition whereby one object goes in and one object goes out, so that you're left with your own areas, Museum of Transology. And I think this sort of this living awareness of inclusivity that is actually brought forward with that, that curatorial practice is really quite interesting. Helena, uh, the... I was intrigued by what you said about the Ital Italian feminism's activism being much more localised, and you're, you, in a way, you discovering them and them, them, uh, their local presence and their local uh, connections and activism being of vastly more significance to them than, than a, a, a more international presence, for instance. Yeah. Can you expand on that a bit? Yeah, or even um, it's not just about them not having, it's not just about local versus international. They're, um, so particularly this, this group in Milan, um, the Libraria de la Donna, they say that it's much more important to have kind of relationships of entrustment between women than it is to try and change the law. So they even decided not to go out on certain political demonstrations around abortion because they said, no, we need to find our own response to what happens to women's bodies. It's not just about this law over that law because it's still in the hands of the patriarchal legal establishment. And the only way we can really change society is by developing a new consciousness, which we have to do in these small groups. Now, there was a kind of a, what they call a double militancy often, where some of the feminists would be very active in the small collectives and also very active on the public political stage. They also became an incredible resource for politicians. So politicians would come and consult with the collective trade unions adopted a lot of their strategies. So at one point in Italian politics, there was um, a kind of specific agenda around, around feminism where there was a big push to get a large number of female MPs who then made themselves available to women to kind of represent them. So this was all, in a way, kind of applying the tactics of the small collective to a bigger context. So it, it's not it's not just about staying small, but it's about this kind of idea of subjective transformation in a smaller group. I'd like to move on to um, collections and exhibitions as a sort of double-pronged activity in institutions. Um, I was really struck by something you said, EJ, where you said that pop-up pop exhibitions pop down. <laughs> and it seems to me this is a really crucial point about Let's take, for instance, The Soul of a Nation, this show organised by Tate Modern, and yet Tate 
modern does not have in any way a significant collection of African-American artists. So to what extent can, and ex I suppose, what ex expectations can we have that exhibitions can help in this rewriting of the canon? And to what extent do they need a significant collecting activity to run alongside that? Soup, do you want to have sure. That's a really important question, and um, I think uh, Soul of Nation is a, a work in progress, and it was a culmination of a, a prolonged research into African American art uh, by some curators at Tate, but also uh, while they were working on particularly acquisition-related research, they realized that there was a very interesting narrative which hasn't been told in British context. I mean, Tate Modern is in London, and it's a bit different story when it's about other sort of types of um, struggles, and when it's decontextualized out of their own sort of um, environment and histories, um, there was certain distance also which can be negative and positive, but uh, we realized that that was a very important part of telling global art histories, mm -hmm. and very much transnational, something um, which goes beyond national borders or nation states. So America is a nation state, but it has a lot of different histories and different racial, ethnic, um, sort of multiple layers about their complicated histories. And um, by doing that show, I think we, we have actually secured some works for the collection. And um, also, um, that work has been ongoing. And we've got more support from our patrons, sort of individuals who help us to build sort of more younger sort of generations of um, American, North American art. So it has been, I would say it was definitely something came out of a research, long-term long research, but also not the end of that process, but still ongoing. Can I, can I add to that? <coughs> Sorry, I just want to add to that because I was struck by what EJ said as well. And I, as I said I've been teaching curating for about 12 years here. And when I began, I used to talk about the exhibitions being the, being the sort of point of the active end of things, that they could activate collections, they could kind of inflect collections. You could do things there that you might not be able to do in the slower moving um, you know, collections world. I think that's totally changed. And I mean, I, I, if I understand what Sue is saying, and it's what I've observed from Tate myself, that actually the impetus behind that exhibition came from acquisition-related activities specifically. So the exhibition wasn't in front of, but it was actually behind. It wasn't exhibitions making activity that then has to go into collections. But of course, these things are cyclical, because what, what you're finding, I know, Sue, um, in, in America is that a lot of the works that were in Tate, it, it, in Soul of the Nation, are now, you know, those artists are being acquired by American collections. Mm -hmm. So there's a sort of cyclical thing going on there. And it builds on what Christopher said in, in his discussion yes. earlier on, which was that you talked about how the market shot up. I mean, in the, I think it was in last November's auction, there were records breaking mm -hmm. left, right, and centre for African American artists, mm -hmm. both male and female. So, uh, the but it, it, the interesting thing is that musicians, uh, museums everywhere are up against it in terms of acquiring these artists. And, and it's right, isn't it, Denise, that that very many museums across the United States do still not have in any way representative collections of, Af of African American artists. Oh, oh, absolutely, absolutely. And it's across all periods. I do think Soul of a Nation, certain other shows have focused on the art of sort of the second half of the 20th century. Some of these uh, venerable artists are still living and making work, etc. And so you see their work now at art fairs and get, being represented by galleries. Uh, all welcome. But but I think about a period that I dealt with in my exhibition, in New York at least, uh, the Harlem Renaissance of the 1920s and 30s. This was a moment of modernism that was exactly concurrent with the School of Paris, for example, unfolding in the same time uh, and with a certain amount of uh, artistic and intellectual exchanges between the Harlem artists who often did long stays in Paris and as we're now beginning to see artists like Matisse, Mondrian, etc. coming to the U.S. and seeking out contact with Harlem artists. Um, 
the two major museums in New York do not have a major collection of Harlem Renaissance. Um, you walk through the early modern galleries and whole rooms full of Stuart Davis, et cetera, et cetera, uh, maybe one Harlem Renaissance painting. A lot of that work is still in private collections for that reason, so it's not like it's not available. So uh, it, it's, it's wonderful to see Sullivan Nation opening uh, eyes about uh, the second half of the 20th century, but I don't think we've given a full account of early modernism uh, until we look at that school of African American artists, writers, uh, et cetera, who had global, had global reach, global influence, drew followers from Europe, from Mexico, from West Africa, uh, but are not represented in the permanent collection galleries of American museums for the most part. And so the, the, one of the things I'm conscious of with, with Tate Modern is that um, certainly in the early stages of the, uh, of the collection, I remember Francis Morris talking about anchors within the collection. And, they, and these anchors were sort of, exactly as it sounds, sort of tethering lots of different uh, streams to them and, and somehow um, creating networks of related related works within folks, certain forms of modernism and in contemporary art. Have the anchors shifted over time? Mm -hmm. Are there still anchors? Uh, if we're talking about the transnational, do we, are we now looking at what looks much more like a web than, than certain fixed points? And I'm getting the best questions. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I think anchors really helped the curators who were not always specialists. We, we grew up, more, we developed as specialists, I think, by working. But um, because the sort of training all these curators had was very canonical art history, we, we wanted some sort of master figures to work around in our little heads. And anchors really helped at the beginning, and um, they still uh, exist as very transformative works in scale, but also historic um, meanings and other uh, sort of ways, <coughs> or one particular cultural sort of implications or the other. Um, now, as you say, it's about more networked, interconnected, um, almost like a very subtly um, emphasized web of works, but also artists. and. In a way, it's the sort of um, expansion of those anchoring works, transformative type of works, which really changed curators, but also our audience's view about art of the 20th century. But um, these sort of smaller and more subtle and more entangled connections, I think they are really the way um, we are now looking at sort of current development in artistic practice. Um, Christopher, how does that relate to the sort of terminology that you might use about the, if you like, the organisation or the networking within your own collection? So, I mean, the one thing I'll say is that I think we've set a somewhat narrower focus at the BMA, and it was enabled in part by the assumption of, of a different mission, but also a desire to connect to this black majority city, and how do you do it? I think that there are first steps in achieving that mission. And just to amplify Denise's point, the market around post-war and also pre-war, African-American has become exponentially more competitive as a consequence of good scholarly work done by curators and directors across the country over the past maybe 10 to 15 years maximum. So we've seen a transformation. Um, so if you want to assemble those collections to tell an American story, you have to not do something else. That, that's the key. So, um, and for me, the difference there lies between sort of what we would say equity and fairness. So if you were to be fair in the present, you know, you would sort of be bifocal or multi multiply focal. If you're being equitable with a view towards historical injustice, then you distort in one direction. You know, so, so my point is if you want that collection, you have the resources, you just got to make a choice. Kind of thing. So that, that's the logic we use. Hilke, in your case, it's an intriguing balance to, in, on the one hand, um, maintain the sort of um, the collection that you have, retell those sto stories, but also introduce the kind of under the radar, non-official GDR 
work which you were attempting to show and, and experienced some resistance to. Um, can you, do you feel that you can still prioritise uh, rewriting the canon of German art in your collection in the way that you intended? Do you have to, uh, are, there, are there different collecting strategies that you can employ to do that? Uh, yeah, but it's still quite difficult, I have to admit. But um, of course it's my um, main aim for the next years to do that. Um, what for me is important and uh, really difficult right now is how to combine this local stories with a global art history that is equally important for me because I don't want to work only on GDR arts. <laughs> what was what I, I did the last two years now. So uh, there's a one thing we're planning and it's really difficult to find an anchor or something to work with. So we are preparing a show on Angela Davis. She was really a kind of pop star in the German Democratic Republic, mm -hmm. and every school kid um, wrote a postcard, free Angela Davis, and um, they had to draw the roses. So it was a campaign by the state called One Million Roses for Angela Davis. Mm -hmm. And so there's an emotional connection to the people in Eastern Germany, and um, she was a of great impact for the East German artists, but on the same time she was very important of course for the black American or female feminist artists too. So what we are preparing is a kind of strange mixture between those two things, but that have in common of course that it's all about um, socialist Marxist utopia and that makes it really um, important for us now. Or oh, we're working on a show that's called, oh, we have two titles and can't dis decide, uh, <laughs> Revolutionary Romances or Colored Comrades. That is about parts of our collection that are solidarity paintings. So uh, the German Democratic Republic tried um, or, or was interested in solidarity to southern um, countries like Vietnam or South Africa or uh, South America. So we try to use this to remind people um, in a um, state that is, or in Saxony, that is quite xenophobic, um, that already in GDR times, um, solidarity was a very important thing. So yeah, but it's difficult. Um, EJ, I wanted to talk about um, uh, collections and exhibitions within the rewriting of queer histories, mm. because obviously we had queer British art mm. not long ago. I know you were doing work around that, and um, it seems to speak to the whole pop up, popping up, and popping down uh, idea to a certain degree. Because apart from anything else, the Tate has had very many works by David Hockney which <laughs> deal unabashedly with queer stories, mm. and yet you, if you were to go to the Tate in the 80s or 90s, it would be very unlikely that you'd see those presented in such a way which told those stories. They would be much more likely to tell the story of the School of London. Um, and they, uh, so, so I suppose what I'm asking is, uh, you talked about sort of ethical conduct within, within curatorial and I guess the entire museum. It, do, you, do you feel there is a... There, there's sort of a structure in place where those queer histories can continue to be explored with real seriousness. And I don't just mean at the tape, but I just mean more generally. The, um, um, the, one of the problems with the Museum of Transology is that it hasn't reached its full potential because it doesn't engage with the permanent collection. Having those conversations is where we can open up looking back into the past through these collections and, and thinking about contextualising gender over time. Um, I'm working, uh, curating an exhibition uh, again at Brighton Museum called Queer the Peer, and it's going to be very fun. Um, one of the nicest things about this is we've got a collection, a beautiful collection, you know, uh, Duncan Grant, Edward James, etc., so all these queer artists from the local area who we can engage with with that collection, but then we've got misrepresented queer communities that are often written out of the local queer history in Brighton. Um, for example, our local LGBT Roma travellers. So we have in, in the collection as well these objects, such as a, uh, a fortune-telling machine with gypsy 
spelt G-I-P-S-Y, and a figure inside it with a third eye, you know, inherently problematic, and it's got no contextual contextualization in the labeling with it. So we've engaged a local artist, Elaine Labasse, to come and work, and through engagement with the objects and the actual fortunes that used to come out of them, the historical artefacts, she's rewriting that with the local Roma group, so it spits out modern queer Roma history. And so it's, it's these complex narratives, these webs that I'm interested in that can place an ongoing conversation. You know, it can really extend that timeline so we can think about these things talking to us into the future as well. And this way, I think we're thinking about more of a legacy, particularly when we invite people to come in, find themselves in the gaps of misrepresentation, the gaps and traps of collection, and write themselves back into those collections as a legacy that will last afterwards. One thing I was thinking about when you were talking about it was there are some collections that have been built up and then incorporated into larger institutions. Mm. Does that deny the continued freedom, if you like, of your exhibition collection? Or in a way, could it could it thrive in, in, um, in those circumstances? Mm, I, I mean, there's always a tension between touring. This is a very complex material collection from latex to human remains, you know, to paper and textiles. So it's very difficult to conserve and keep in that condition. Um, so there's that tension of wanting to look after it so it is there in 100 years' time. Um, and then the potential it has to keep telling its story because, like I said, these, these conversations aren't finished and they're certainly privileged in the southeast. And so I think that by working with this process of continuing to collect by empowering local communities, upskilling them, even down to the process of having them know what an object entry form is, you know, writing labels, engaging them with the process of making within the institution so that they feel empowered rather than disempowered is a way of seeing them enter the museum for longer term engagement. And so, for example, now we see that we have volunteers that have worked on the initial exhibition are now volunteering on, on other collections. Um, I think I think it's growing this process of collecting. The idea of swapping in and swapping out of living exhibitions, I find really, um, I think that has potential. Um, in lots of different ways, I think you, a lot of you have dealt with the sort of network of staffing in institutions and the ways in which that can affect the way that collections are assembled, interpreted, etc. Denise, I was struck by something you talked about, about how sort of registrar level, a lot of the institutional prejudices were, were contained and passed on and all that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. um, can, you, can you talk a bit more about, in a way, about what you encounter, but also what sort of changes need to happen now to those kind of structures in order for these stories to properly emerge and for, these, for the canon to be rewritten? Well, and one thing I would say is I'm not necessarily saying that, say, the current uh, registrar of a museum that still has a lot of 19th century paintings that retain these racially pejorative titles. I mean, it's the legacy that's been passed on. A lot of times these titles were set in the 19th century itself. The artist dies, it goes into collections, and they have to be cataloged. And just almost informally, their name using the usage of the time, the nomenclature of the time. And perhaps the collector wasn't very engaged with the history, doesn't know that the artist uh, had records showing. So, so it's the fact that this kind of just informally, almost casually, but also sometimes gratuitously, does take place and then is left for generations and generations without being examined. So I think the I found that when we were going through the renaming exercise first at, uh, at the Wallach in New York and certainly with the Orsay in Paris, uh, curators were not objecting to the idea at all. They, one curator in particular told me this is the, I've never been happier to rename a work, to get rid of the term digress. It's just been sitting there unexamined and unchallenged. And that is why you have to have diverse voices within in the institution so that somebody sitting there is going to be as offended as the public would be when this thing is put on view and is calling attention to it and thinking about how to deal with it. And I just to, yeah, oh, sorry, just, that's all right. I mean, I would say just 
we're doing these kinds of violences all the time without realizing because we're, we're using the classificatory systems of the time. So around gender, I'm sure in the future, we're going to look back and go, oh my God, how brutal. Mm -hmm. You had to be male or female. Like, what was that all about? Mm -hmm. Or the fact that artists who are not Western European, and you made a related point, are identified by their country of origin. And sometimes it's often done with kind of good liberal good intent. Oh, fantastic, we're showing an artist from Ethiopia. But again, it's a kind of like classifying and mm -hmm. othering, mm -hmm. which we just do casually. And by the way, th on that particular rel seemingly minor point, uh, one of the conventions of gallery labeling is to show the nationality of yes. artists, as well as where they're born mm -hmm. and, and, and mm -hmm. died. and. I had issues with that for my contemporary gallery because we had artists who were, say, born in Ethiopia and raised in the United States. Uh, I didn't want to art uh, ask them what they, it's none of our business, really. I think the facts, born in Ethiopia, lives and works in the United States without stating nationality. But I got serious pushback from editors who are used to working in that convention of we state their nationality, not the simple facts of where, where they were born and where they live and work, and had to just really forcefully overrule that. And then the artists themselves will say, well, do we have to specify that at all? I'm happy not to have to tell you whether I'm an, an, an immigrant or an American citizen at this point. I'm happy at least to just have say that I was born in Ethiopia and live and work in the United States. But, but even saying born in Ethiopia sets up a certain narrative around that artist that wouldn't necessarily be the case if they were American or Western European. So but these are conventions that have been in place for a very long time, and people are very dug in in terms of, well, we've always done it this way. Why should we re-examine this? I think that's a really interesting point in the context of what's happening right now outside the Whitney Museum in New York in terms of uh, decolonize this place, protesting uh, the ways in which um, uh, the, the trustees of that organization do not in any way reflect the works in those displays by transnational artists and uh, undocumented. Very yeah, and exactly, and and also obviously there's the very specific issue about the tear gas and the etc. But but I'm, I'm conscious that um, Chris, you had um, you spoke specifically about changing the governance of of a museum in order to, and it seems to me that we can, we can talk a great deal about, about um, making these changes, but fundamentally the biggest level at which museums are going to change is if the governance is dealt with. And, I, and I'm not sure how easy that is across the board in America. I don't wonder if you might speak to the experience you had, but also what, what possibility there, there is of having that kind of wider change in, in the governance of American museums. Um, well, I think none of the changes that I described at the BMA are none of the changes that you could imagine enacting at any other institution are possible without the Board of Trustees. So, you know, in American institutions, they are the, they are the economic foundation of you know, our annual fund, which is everything that allows us to do work, do work from acquisitions to exhibition making. So unless those people are aligned with the values that you've made the basis of your institution, then you're going nowhere. So there are a couple of ways to do it. One is to engage in kind of <laughs> forced re-education, which is you know, part of what we did. It's just make people aware of intrinsic bias. And once aware, they have the tools to undo. So that, that's one. Another is repopulating the board with diverse perspectives, voices. Um, and that helps tremendously, too. So, but um, if I were to channel Darren Walker, the president of the Ford Foundation, on this subject, he would say it's incredibly difficult to balance the imperative to have a financially sustaining board and to have a diverse one because wealth is not distributed evenly in America, period, you know, as a consequence of. He, he, again, he would say transatlantic slave trade. You're dealing with the consequences of that right now. Mm -hmm. So if you want to have billionaires on your board, very likely it's mm -hmm. going to be hard to find an African American. Mm -hmm. Not impossible, mm -hmm. but not at all, but challenging mm -hmm. and a limited group. So how do you balance that need for sustainability financially with your deepest existential imperatives as a museum? Mm -hmm. And I think he would just say, you know, be creative. <laughs> 
deal with it, figure out a way to do it. have some board members that are there for other reasons than their checkbooks? Uh, you, well, that is one way to do it. That's one way that we. That's one way that we've done it. Is by you know we work wisdom and wealth, and so we you know there is a little bit of wealth. There's a, hopefully a kind of prevailing wisdom, and there's a lot of a lot of a lot of work. So but but that, that does. But speak. on the other hand, the reality is, if you're talking about change in collection, you're talking ultimately about acquisitions, etc. Yep. So you do have to have board members who've got the checkbooks, who is uh, who are uh, in sync with the values that you're mm -hmm. trying to mm -hmm. uh, embed in the way the museum presents uh, art history. And, and there again, I mean, even just doing a, an exhibition, not dealing with uh, presenting acquisitions for a permanent collection, there will be the divide between uh, 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 board members or, or people who are deducing what board members might think, saying, we don't deal with sociology here. These are political issues. We are a museum of fine art. But then, you know, that they will have books, you know, that give you the entire biographies of all of the canonical artists, uh, the museum has been dealing with social commentary and biography and all of this stuff. It's not just formal analysis. It only becomes an issue when we're looking at certain types of images. Mm -hmm. So it's a real challenge to get people to rethink their assumptions and mm -hmm. to un to but in a way that engages them rather than alienates them, because some percentage of these folks have to be uh, have to be persuaded. They do. That's the reality. Um, I wanted to speak a bit about artists as agent of, agents of change. I think it, all of you, in your different ways, I think have actually spoken about the way that artists can uh, can be can be important. Um, uh, can it can can. Uh, develop these ideas almost naturally, and a lot of a lot of your a lot of you seem to feed feed off artists and and their ideas. In in <laughs> their, I suppose the that most artists do not think in terms of canons, <laughs> and this is an interesting thing. I think you know Denise, from what you're saying, you've you've consulted lots of artists about about in going about your work. Is that is is that the case? Would you say that I did studio visits that? with all of the living artists in my show for sure. Yeah. So, so would you would you say that um, that I suppose how how have artists contributed to your work, would you say? There is an ambivalence. Uh, artists at root want to be known for the formal aspects of their work. Uh, I think about the uh, I think about the artist Carol Walker, for example, uh, African American woman working with very uh, 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 stunning or shocking uh, visualizations of aspects of uh, American racial history, and uh, she has written. I'm not speaking out of school here. She has publicly said uh, th that she craves. Uh, having people write just about the formal aspects of her work and the way her black silhouettes are rooted in a history of that uh, medium that goes back into the 19th century and earlier. So on the one hand, artists, that is fundamental to what artists want. Uh, but on the other hand, there is a sense of not going along with you know what's already there. There's a sense, a, a, a profound uh, personal and artistic vision that I have to use my art making capability to command the attention of broad audiences to create awareness, to build uh, conscious, to, uh, to, to, to help people understand what these issues are and what can be done to broaden uh, the way that we talk about art and and by definition of culture. Art is used, art and cultural definitions are used to define who is, who's American, who's normative or not. And breaking down all of these agendas is definitely part of what artists want their practice to be engaged with. I guess it's fair to say also that there are artists and artists, depends which artists you talk to. Right. Yeah. Um, 
I remember when Tate Modern opened in 2000 and they'd overturned, the, there was a whole harouche about the overturning of chronology. It was Cornelia Parker who was one of the first to say, well, artists don't think chronologically. You know, we go wherever we will. At the same time, when MoMA tried their modern starts, you know, uh, similar transformation, uh, seismic transformation of their collections. Um, there was a massive backlash from, from some of the old, you know, the, the great white artists, Frank Stella and so on, saying, what the hell are you doing? Well, with that, you know, this, this is our art. You're, tinkering with. So, I mean, it can, it can play every which way, I'd say. Chris, you've, you, I know that artists have been at the heart of, obviously, in, in terms of the way that, um, that you've changed the collection, but have, um, and discussions with artists have been part of that process. Oh, my gosh, absolutely. I mean, there are, every good idea I've ever had has been stolen from an artist. <laughs> I mean, just truly. Um, yeah, and, and I think that even beyond questions of... Um, their own personal canons, and I do believe that artists have their own kind of capricious personal canons, and it's not tethered to a chronology, not at all. <laughs> and Denise and I were just talking about this. You know, what, what does Micheline Thomas' history of the reclining nude look like? I mean, that is substantially more interesting than the one I learned reading, you know, Jansen. So, um, <laughs> but I will also say in terms of exhibition or institution building, I'm not really looking at other museums and what they're doing at the moment. I'm looking at a whole generation of American artists, and I'm thinking here of Mark Bradford, of Theaster Gates, um, Titus Kaffar, who are building their own institutions to sustain their own ecologies. And that is, that, that's kind of the next revolution to me. Is Yes, they've been leading the way artistically, but now they're beginning to lead the way as institution builders. And most of what museums need to become is embedded there. So that's my next theft, is, is from them. <laughs> what, about, um, sorry, you, go ahead. what about the, you know, Nan Golden forcing the National Portrait Gallery um. to turn down that gift? I mean, I think artists have incredible power, which they don't always use, but when they dig their heels in, they can really make a change. That's right. Um, I'm conscious that we, we're going to open up to questions on, from the floor in a minute, but I just want to ask one, one last question about, about the idea of uh, transnational collection and display. Um, does it affect the nature of specialisms in the sense that do you have, will curators have to shift so they have multiple specialisms, or will you have the same categories of specialism but operating in a different structure? So we are still um, really valuing the specialist knowledge about a particular region or medium. I think it's more about working together. Even in the same institution, we don't necessarily really work collaboratively to the extent you would expect. <laughs> and um, knowing that some artists sort of are diasporic and migrated or really sort of uh, literally breaking down all these national sort of nation-bound kind of ideas, then we work with sort of artists from Japan but lived and worked in Brazil. How do we work? Which committee, accreditation committee, will give the money? Right. And um, these sort of <laughs> questions were really prevalent and it's becoming much more relevant to today's practice. So we, we are trying to learn how to work collaboratively with this deep knowledge about particular regions. So um, don't know how it will go, but that's the aim. <laughs> Great. Well, um, I'm sure you agree that we've learnt a tremendous amount today and I feel my mind is boggling in a very good way. I feel also that we're right at the start. <laughs> I'm, I'm aware that what, what we've also been talking about very long histories before these, ter these discussions have come to the fore, and therefore there's a certain urgency about everything that we've heard today. So I'd like to thank everybody. Before we open up the floor, I'd just like to thank all these great speakers for coming in and saying such wonderful things and, and in igniting such an interesting debate. Thank you all. Yeah.